Okay, welcome everyone to our Sunday evening Sutra and Dharma talk. So tonight we'll begin our first session on the 48 great vows of Amitabha Buddha. And as usual, before we go into uh, any Sutra talk, we will all make an introductory session uh, to share a bit about the background of the Sutra, a bit of history before we go into the discussion of the Sutra. And before we do that, I would like to invite you to please join your hands to your heart center and repeat after me. Namo Fundamental Teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo Fundamental Teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo Fundamental Teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha. Sutra opening words. The unsurpassed, profound, subtle and wondrous dharma is difficult to encounter in hundreds of millions of kapas. I now see and hear it, receive and uphold it. May we understand the true meaning of the Tathagata. Namo pure ocean-wide assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Namo Amitabha Buddha. So a bit of introduction and background so we just finished the uh, 10 great vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, uh, the practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra from uh, the great Mahayana Sutra, Avatansanka Sutra, or also known as the Flower Adornment Sutra. And the reason why we begin with that sutra before we even go into uh, one of the three primary Pure Land Sutra is really to get us to have an overview a little bit, like a bit of taste into the Mahayana domain. Right? Although Buddhism is one, we do see that the Buddhist teachings are actually quite diverse. And when we are entering into the Mahayana domain, we can see it's really a little bit different from if you were accustomed to maybe uh, Theravada Buddhism or like entry level of Buddhism, like when we first learn about Buddhism, maybe from Google, right? when we talk about the uh, Four Noble Truths, uh, no, the Noble Eightfold Path, etc., right? Uh, those, it's indeed the Buddhist teaching, the Buddha's earliest teachings. And what we are talking about here, uh, when people who are not familiar with Buddhism, or they only know a little bit about Buddhism, they may think, oh, this does not sound like uh, the normal Buddhism that we hear from, or uh, conventional Buddhism, or People may think like mainstream Buddhism right, is most likely because they are unfamiliar with Mahayana Buddhism. So when we talk about uh, the Mahayana Buddhism and from uh, the great Mahayana sutras such as the Avatansanka Sutra, uh, Lotus Sutra, like all these great Mahayana sutras, we understand a little bit more about the uh, cosmology uh, of Mahayana Buddhism. So we don't just talk about one Buddha in one world. Yeah, usually people only know, if they don't know about Mahayana Buddhism, they only know about Shakyamuni Buddha in the Saha world, and that's it. Whereas once you begin to learn about uh, Mahayana Sutras, studying Mahayana Buddhism, you will realize in all these Mahayana Sutras, the Buddha always mentioned uh, about different Buddhas in different Buddha lands. Uh, to us, this is like everyday, Alive uh, to us Mahayana Buddhists. Uh, particularly, we see in the language of the Avatansanka Sutra, the practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. Like it always says, like uh, to all the Buddhas in the ten directions of the three time periods, like all the Buddha lands, like the fine mode of dust, like, like all this kind of language. Once we begin to be familiar with this kind of language, then we start to understand the Mahayana domain. Uh, Mahayana domain is actually the entire Dharma realm. Uh, when I say the entire Dharma realm, I mean the entire cosmos, the entire existence, uh, all the realms that you can and also much beyond uh, your, what your mind can even perceive or understand. So infinite realms, infinite worlds, infinite Buddhas and infinite Buddha lands. Uh, there are infinite Buddhas and infinite Buddha lands teaching sentient beings. So that's like uh, the Mahayana cosmology. 
And this is important for us Mahayana Buddhists to know. So you really have a much uh, extensive world view of the universe. Like when we say universe uh, in Buddhism, it's like the Dharma ramp. But when we use the universe in the conventional world, it probably only means like the observable universe, right? Whereas uh, the universe in Buddhism is actually the entire Dharma ramp. The observable universe is only like a fine mode of dust. Like when we put into the scope of the Mahayana domain, the Dharma ramp. Like this really helps us to greatly expand our mind and then to, uh, for us to understand like what the state of the Buddha is truly like. like a Buddha is a completely awakened being who absolutely understands everything in the entire Dharma realm, in the, all the 10 directions of the three periods of time. So this is actually the real ability of the Buddhas. And that's why to realize the Buddhahood, the ultimate enlightenment, like it's really like the greatest thing that's worth any sentient being to pursue in this life and many lifetimes. Uh, when we enter into the Mahayana domain, when we study Mahayana Buddhism, it's also very much about to generate the bodhicitta, to cultivate the bodhisattva practices, so one can eventually realize Buddhahood. Now, Sometimes it's also not so easy to generate bodhicitta and to cultivate the bodhisattva practices. Like we also discussed, like maybe due to uh, some people's karmic obstacles, it's difficult. It's even if we generate a bodhicitta, even if we cultivate the bodhisattva practices, it is still difficult to realize Buddhahood. And that's why Shakyamuni Buddha also opened another path, the Pure Land path, also known as the easier path, like the easiest path. Uh, even for those who cannot generate bodhicitta in this lifetime, if you go to the Pure Land, then you will definitely immediately generate bodhicitta and to cultivate the bodhisattva practices. Like this is, will be your first uh, lesson 101, like Guan Yin and Da Shi Zhi Pu Sa, all these bodhisattvas, they will teach you that when you go to the Pure Land. And so why uh, bodhicitta is so important? It's really through generating bodhicitta to cultivate the bodhisattva practices, right? to have the mind that aspire for the ultimate enlightenment to help all sentient beings. It's really through this process of selfless service that bodhisattvas eventually get rid of the illusional self. Right? Remember the basic level of enlightenment is non-attachment to the illusional self. And then it is really because of sentient beings, I remember from our uh, practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, it is because of sentient beings, I, the Bodhisattvas understand that all sentient beings share the same Buddha nature. Because of all sentient beings share the same Buddha nature, they do not want to see anyone to suffer. So it's because of sentient beings, they generate compassion. And it's just through the heart of great compassion they generate bodhicitta. And through bodhicitta, they realize Anuttaya Sanya Sambodhi, otherwise known as the full Buddhahood. So that is really the process for any bodhisattva or any being that want to reach the ultimate Buddhahood. And there are also different practices and the Pure Land Path is the easiest out of all, right? and which we all know because due to Amitabha Buddha's great vows, he vowed to receive all sentient beings who hear his name. If we can recite his name with faith and with the aspiration to go to his land, even for 10 recitations at the time of death, he will come to receive us. And we know all this. And where is this from? Right? From the 48 great vows of Amitabha Buddha. And most people are, uh, know about this inside the 18th vow. Uh, but apart from that most important 18th vow, there are in total 48 great vows. So when we are in the Mahayana domain, we, we know that all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they have great vows. They always make great vows to save sentient beings. Right? For instance, Shakyamuni Buddha had 500 great vows. For those who are curious, you can Google them afterwards. Guan Yin made 12 great vows. 
And one of Guan Yin's uh, 12 gray vows also include to receive sentient beings to Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land. Medicine Buddha, 12 gray vows. Uh, it's also one of Medicine Buddha's vows to receive beings to Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land, should they wish to. And also Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, 10 gray vows, which we had uh, just studied. So why do they need to make great vows to save sentient beings? Can they not make vows and save sentient beings? <laughs> so it's best to make vows to save sentient beings because when we make vows, it's like you have this direction and there's this motivation. Uh, you will not be lost. Uh, you are clear with your direction, with where you are going. It's like a company. Uh, when you start a company, you also need to have like this mission statement, like what you're going to do. Like, it's also a little bit like that to have great vows because on a road of success, like one can encounter so many obstacles and difficulties. And it's so easy for people to give up. Like whether one is running a business or doing other things and including even practice the Bodhisattva practices. We, you will encounter a lot of obstacles on your path. And if we don't have these great vows, if, if, if Bodhisattvas don't have these great vows, it's also easy for them to maybe lose motivation, to be a little bit confused. So these great vows are like really like great guidance. And it's like a petrol, a petrol to your car that will always keep them going, regardless of what happens. Uh, they're clear what they're here to do. So it's actually important to make great vows. Uh, and really all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have great vows. And their great vows uh, can be different. It can be quite different actually. But the essence is all the same. Uh, the essence is also to help all sentient beings but it's also due to the different Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They have also a different karma. So for them, they also in a way have like different missions, a different ways, different skillful means to help sentient beings. So you know, if we were to become Bodhisattvas, we should also make vows. And what kind of vows should we make? Uh, maybe we're not so sure at this stage yet, but if you're not so sure, then you know, look at Bodhisattva Samadabhadra's 10 great vows. I recite them every day and they can be your vows. And look, look at Amitabha Buddha's 48 great vows. I recite them maybe every day or every week and they can also be your great vows. So it's important for us to learn to know about this great Buddhas and Bodhisattva's great vows. And they can also greatly help uh, with our study and to enhance our practice and we can truly understand, uh, maybe cannot truly understand, but we can have a feel, have a taste of the infinite compassion of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and how they really want all sentient beings to liberate from all sufferings in life. They really want all beings to realize uh, the ultimate enlightenment. So a bit of an introduction and background to uh, the 48 great vows. As most of you know, uh, if you are Pure Land Buddhist, you must be familiar with uh, the Infinite Life Sutra, or also known as the Longer Sukhavati Sutra. So I apologize of my Sanskrit pronunciation. Right? Uh, I think I, I need to really learn some Sanskrit later. So in um, Pure Land Buddhism, we are familiar with the three primary Pure Land Sutras. Right, the Infinite Life Sutra, the Amitabha Sutra. The Amitabha Sutra is also known as the shorter uh, Sukhavati Yoha Sutra. And then the Visualization Sutra, or in Sanskrit, I think it's called Amitabha Dhyana Sutra, also known as the Meditation Sutra. So slight different uh, translation uh, of the names. But these are really the primary Pure Land Sutras that talk about uh, the Pure Land, Amitabha Buddha, and the practice, how to attain rebirth to the Pure Land. And also in Chinese Pure Land Buddhism, we also have two extra uh, Mahayana Sutras added to make up five Pure Land Sutras, uh, which I talked about before. I, we just finished one of them, the practices and vows of Bodhisattva Samadabhadra. Uh, we just learned the key content from that uh, chapter where Bodhisattva Samadabhadra and all the great Bodhisattvas also sought rebirth to the Pure Land. 
So the pure land path, although it's the easy path, and for many people who cannot attain enlightenment in this lifetime, but we see even the highest level of enlightened body sattvas, like from that sutra, still seek rebirth to Amitabha Buddha's pure land. So the pure land path is really incredible in that it really receives all beings, whether you are like the highest capacity, highest level of enlightened being, like Bodhisattva, Samadabhadra, Manjushri, like all these great Bodhisattvas, or you are like an ordinary being like, who don't know much about the Buddha Dharma at all. Amitabha Buddha welcomes all. And why even the highest uh, level of enlightened Bodhisattva still want to go to Amitabha Buddha's pure land because they all know that in there, they can realize Buddhahood ASAP, right? Amitabha Buddha's pure land indeed surpassed like, all the other Buddha lands in the 10 directions, particularly in terms of how fast, fast track we can attain uh, the ultimate enlightenment. And this we will understand better when we study uh, the 48 great baths in depth. And then also from the Surugama Sutra, uh, where Da Shi Ji Pusa, a Bodhisattva Mahasama Prabhta, talk about how she, uh, he attained uh, Nianfo Samadhi, like Amitabha recitation uh, Samadhi. So all this uh, we will all talk about in great details in the near futures. Now, it's not only just three or five Pure Land Sutras in Mahayana Buddhism mentioned about the Pure Land and Amitabha Buddhas. In fact, it said there are about 290 Mahayana works that all talk about Amitabha Buddha uh, and uh, the Pure Land. Like also in the Lotus Sutra, it's also mentioned. So really a lot of Mahayana works all trying to point us to the Pure Land path. And what's so special about the Infinite Life Sutra is that it's really the longest out of the, uh, all the five Pure Land Sutras actually. And it's uh, also most comprehensive and complete. Like once you study the Infinite Life Sutras, a lot of uh, questions you have about the Pure Land, like a lot of uh, commonly asked questions I receive, all this, you, it can be found in the Infinite Life Sutra. So I may not reply to uh, the messages or comments I receive because I know that as time goes by, as I keep explaining uh, the details in the sutra, they will all find the answers here. And the Pure Land Pass is, of course, originated from ancient India. And it was once very popular in ancient India, I think around the first to the second century uh, in uh, maybe Kashmir and other areas. I think you can Google about that. Uh, but so it originated from India and then it came into China. And there are actually uh, quite a few different translated version of the Infinite Life Sutra into Chinese. Actually many versions, right? So it said the Infinite Life Sutra has been translated for 12 times into the Chinese. Now only five versions have been kept in the Chinese Buddhist canon. So we have seven versions missing and then we have five versions left. And these five versions, the general framework and principles are actually similar. Uh, but what's different, uh, some content may be a little bit different such as the number of valves. Like some have 24 vows or 36 vows or 48 vows. But 48 vows we're most familiar with. And why there are so many different translated versions into Chinese? It's actually rare for any sutra to be translated so many times and even with different versions. It's most likely that the Buddha had actually talked about this Dharma for many times. Uh, imagine it's such an important dharma. Uh, in one of the sutras, the Buddha said, remember we talk about why the Buddha entered Paranirvana earlier, right? It was because uh, Lord Mara, like the uh, sort of like the evil king from the desire realm wanted the Buddha to 
enter Paranamana earlier uh, because he did not want so many people to hear the Buddha's teaching to become awakened, to liberate out of samsara. So he said, Buddha, please, I go into uh, Paranamana now. I don't talk about the Dharma anymore. And he said, not only that, he said in the Dharma ending age, which is where we are now, he said he will get uh, his grandchildren uh, to also come down here and maybe to wear your ropes, uh, to be in amongst the Sangha and to destroy the right Dharma. And he said that. Well, the Buddha had a bit of tear in his eyes and said, well, at that time, I will teach sentient beings the method to help them realize Buddhahood in one lifetime. And the method the Buddha was referring to, implying, now we know, is actually the Pure Land method, the Pure Land Dharma. That's why the Buddha actually most likely talk about this many times. The Buddha cannot only talk about this such important uh, practice just once. Uh, it's really a lot to talk about, the Pure Land Dharma. It's not only the 18th vow. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, Pure Land Buddhism is so easy. Uh, there's only just the 18th vow and that's it, uh, nothing else. It's not like that. Uh, once you go into the details of this uh, great uh, Mahayana Pure Land Sutras, you realize, wow, this path is so incredible. There's uh, so much to learn about. So it's most likely uh, reasonable that the Buddha had maybe in different occasions and talk about this Dharma for numerous times. So there have been actually many different translated versions into the Chinese. But uh, out of the five versions, there are two versions that are the most well-known. Uh, the first is known as the larger sutra of the Amitabha Buddha in Chinese, Da Ami Tuo Jing. So this has been translated by a Kusana translator, uh, Lokasema in the earlier Han period. So Kusana, I think it's like an ancient uh, India or ancient uh, at that time, maybe Afghanistan, I, I don't know. I'm not so sure you can Google that, like in different areas, a little bit different from uh, the geography nowadays. So from around 223 to 253 CE. At that time, this has been translated into Chinese. It's actually the first infinite life sutra that has been translated into the Chinese. And the second that most people are familiar with, and also for English speaker, is that the Buddha speaks of the infinite life sutra. This was translated by the Indian Buddhist monk, uh, Sagavarman, in 252 CE at the White Horse Temple in Luoyang city in China. So the White Horse Temple is the very first Buddhist temple that was established in China. So this sutra actually came into China at a very early time, right, when the Buddha Dharma first came into China and not too long after that, the sutra had been translated. And also this one, the second version, the Buddha speaks of the Infinite Life Sutra, it has been translated uh, into English, I think, and also uh, maybe quite, by quite a few, many others. And we know a very famous translation by the Japanese uh, BDK and then also uh, other people. And what we're gonna study today is actually a compilation of all the five existing Pure Land Sutras by Upaksaka Xia Lianju, uh, which he did this work in 1935, uh, after three years of really intensive, diligently uh, to compile this work. So why this compilation? And also throughout the history uh, in Chinese Buddhism, they had also been quite a lot of a uh, compilation of the Pure Land Sutras and also commentaries. So if the Buddha has spoken of the Dharma at different occasions, at different times, then the compilation is actually easiest for us to study, right? Because maybe in one Dharma assembly, he talked about this in this aspect, and then in another, he talked about that. So instead of studying all five of them, right? we might as well just compile all the five sutras 
uh, into one. This is not the easiest for us to study. And for the five sutras, there are also many contents that are uh, similar or overlapped. But there are also other contents that are different. So by including them, compiling them into one uh, great sutra, we will not miss any information. So I actually did a comparison myself like last year uh, when I uh, study the Infinite Life Sutra, when I look at uh, the Buddha speaks of the Infinite Life Sutra, which is the most popular and most translated one into English right, in the Western world. And then when I look at the compound version by Upasaka Xialianju, right, the full title of that compound version is called The Buddha Speaks of the Mahayana Infinite Life, Adornment, Purity, Equality, and Enlightenment Sutra. So Chinese for Shou Da Chen Wu Liang Shou, Zhuang Yan Qing Jing Ping Jue Jing. So that one, I actually did a comparison myself because uh, I'm also, you know, want to know like how good a quality right, is this compilation. And I realized it really does include right, a lot more details than just the Buddha speaks of the Infinite Life Sutra, particularly one detail. In the Buddha speaks of the Infinite Life Sutra, there's one chapter uh, talk about the three levels of rebirth. And also the same for the compilation version that also talk about three levels of rebirth. But in the second one, the Buddha speaks of the Infinite Life Sutra. It did not mention about how uh, practitioners of other Mahayana Buddhists, how they can also go to the Pure Land. Whereas in that compiled version, it mentioned that for other practitioners of uh, Mahayana Buddhist, if they also practice other practices like we see now, like maybe Chan practitioner or I don't know, Tian Tai school, Vinaya school, like different schools of practitioner. If they also believe in Amitabha Buddha and um, recite his name and vow to go to his land, they can also attain reports to his land. So this was not mentioned uh, in the most popular translated one into English like currently. So in China, if we were to study the Infinite Life Sutra, like this version, the one I'm currently, I'm gonna talk about is actually the most popular. Like this is amongst all the Chinese community also around the world. Uh, Master Qin Kong also talk about this one. My teacher, Master Ren Shan also exposed this one in length, like 298 episodes. Each episode is about two hours long. So really, like great, great details. And once you study this, you will absolutely have maybe no more questions about the Pure Land Dharma. So that's why uh, I intend to talk about this version. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe there is actually a complete English translation yet. Like, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I just uh, did not find it when I Google it. That this was maybe last year. Uh, but what I found is like some parts of it have been translated, but not like a full translation. Also because the sutra is quite long. Uh, so I also intend to do a translation in the near future as we uh, keep on going and keep studying them. So I believe this version is indeed the most complete, detailed, and the language is also quite easy to understand. And also Upasaka Xialianju is a great Buddhist uh, teacher Dharma teacher and great practitioner. Uh, and he did not actually make up anything himself, right? He just took out what's from uh, these five existing versions and compiled them really beautifully, uh, eloquently into one version. And this is really easy for us to study. So we will actually not miss any important information. So really rejoice in his merit. Okay, so. Before we talk about the 48 great vows of Amitabha Buddha, it's probably important to know who is Amitabha Buddha. Now, most of us know that Amitabha Buddha is the great Buddha that resides in the Western Pure Land of Ultimate Bliss. But who was Amitabha Buddha before he realized Buddhahood? So the opening of the Infinite Life Sutra, like the first two, chapters is about, you know, uh, who were in the assemblies, like these great disciples of the Buddhas, great uh, bodhisattvas who practice the bodhisattva Samadhabhadra's practices. Yes, 
uh, chapter two also mentioned about bodhisattvas, uh, some Madhavadras practices, like all these great bodhisattvas who all practice bodhisattvas, some Madhavadras practices, they all come together to gather uh, to listen to what Shaking Muni Buddha is going to say. Uh, and then Ananda sort of asked the Buddha a question because uh, Shaking Muni Buddha appeared like really bright, like in, in this great bright light. And then he asked, Oh, your honor one, what are you thinking about? Who are you contemplating? Uh, in which Buddha, in which world, etc. So quite an interesting uh, opening. Uh, for those who are interested, you can go and read about it. Uh, it's similar to the, the Buddha speaks of the Infinite Life Sutra, uh, but a little bit different, uh, more or less the same. And then after uh, Shakyamuni Buddha said, well, Ananda, you ask a very good question, like what you have asked today will benefit infinite sentient beings in infinite worlds in the, in the future. And then he, he talked about a previous life of Amitabha Buddha. So the Buddha said to Ananda, in the distant past, innumerable, incalculable, and inconceivable car parts ago, like Buddha clearly knows and sees like everything in the 10 directions, past, present, and future, it like, doesn't matter how long ago the Buddha knows clearly the like, inconceivable state of liberation of the Buddha. And he said, a Tathagata named Lakeshvara Raja, oh, I sort of translated as Tathagata of the World Freedom King, right, from the Chinese, Shi Zi Zai Wang Ru Lai, appeared in the world who taught for 42 kapas. So also a bit of an explanation here, right? When we talk about if in the sutra, in the Buddha sutra, you often see kappa as like a time measurement. But what does one kappa mean? And if it doesn't mention what kind of kappa, right? It says 42 kappas. It implies great kappa. It means it's 42 great kappas. So what is one great kappa? One great kappa on the sutra, it tells us that it equals to four median kappas. And one median kappa equals to 20 small kappas. And one small kappa equals to one increasing kappa plus one decreasing kappa. So what is one increasing kappa and one decreasing kappa? So one decreasing kappa is like from the sutra, the Buddha told us that in the past, uh, also innumerable, okay, years ago, uh, human beings lifespan could actually be age 80,000 years. I know to us, it sounds like really unbelievable where we can maybe at most live up to a hundred years now, but really, really in like a long, 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 long time ago, they were beings that could live much, much, much longer. And they could age to 80,000 years. And for 80,000 years, every 100 years, they will decrease by one year like this until they could only have 10 years. So until their lifespan only becomes 10 years. Like all of this time adding up together, it's called one decreasing kappa. And what's called one increasing kappa is from that 10 years of lifespan. You may ask, you know, how could people only have average lifespan about 10 years, right? When the world really became like, so much a like, disaster. And from the sutra, it told us that during that time, like, people can use the grass on the ground. The grass can even be the weapon. And you can kill people with the grass on the ground. And then through that time, right, from 10 years, and every 100 years, it will increase by one year until again, 80,000 years. So this is called one increasing kappa. So one increasing kappa plus one decreasing kappa is about, is one small kappa. And I found this calculation, I'm not a mathematician, but we have a mathematician in the group, so you can tell me later, but I just sort of, uh, I Googled it. So one great kappa is about uh, 1.3 billion years. Yes, so that is one great kappa. So just a bit of a common Buddhist terminology for you to know, like in the Buddhist sutra, 
you often see the numbers the Buddha use or the metaphor the Buddha talk about are really, really beyond what we can actually understand with our current level of mind. Yet kappa is in Mahayana domain is like a very small unit. <laughs> this 1.3 billion years is like nothing in the scope of the universe or the Dharma realm. So anyway, so back to where we were. So there was a great king named the world abundant king, Shi Rao Wang. So I actually could not find the Sanskrit name uh, of this king because in that version, uh, the one that I said has been translated into English, it did not mention the name of the king, right? But where we, we have actually the name of the king. So Shi Rao Wang, world abundant king. And the Buddhas, this was actually Amitabha Buddha's past life. Of course, Amitabha Buddha had many past lives, just like all of us, but this was one of his past lives. And this king, having heard the Buddha's teaching, so Buddha here referred to Lokeshvara Raja, the Tathagata of World Freedom King. So having heard of the Buddha's teaching, he immediately renounced his kingdom and everything and became a monk called Dhammakara. Now this we may be familiar with. Dhammakara or also known as Dharma storehouse or treasure. So in Chinese, Fa Zhang, like Dharma, not only just mean like Buddha Dharma, like Dharma is like everything. Like the Buddha Dharma actually contains everything, everything in the, in the whole of the entire existence. Right? And storehouse, what it's saying is that our, what it means is that our Buddha nature actually store all the treasures that you've been looking for, absolutely everything. So that was his Dharma name. It's like all of us, uh, if you maybe take the three refuges, you will get a Dharma name. And if you become a monk or a nun later, you will also have another Dharma name. So that's kind of like the meaning of his Dharma name at that time. And then we may also wonder why he renounced his kingdom and throne and to become a monk. Like this to us Buddhists, like for people who sort of understand a bit better about the Buddha's teachings, it's actually not too difficult to understand. But for people in the conventional world, like they will think, oh, this person must be crazy. It's like Shakyamuni Buddha in our world who also renounced his kingdom. It's like Guan Yin's incarnation in China. I, also a princess renounced or the palace and also like a Bodhidharma also used to be a, a king in, in ancient India and also renounced and then came to China to become the first Chen patriarch. So a lot of stories like this, I, a lot of people, they were in great position great power, they have absolutely everything available to them. Everything that people try so hard in our world to pursue, they just give up for what? To become a monk, to do what? To cultivate the Bodhisattva's practices in pursuit of the ultimate enlightenment. So why is that? Like, this really shows that like, what they're really trying to show us is that there's really indeed something much more then that's much worth for us to pursue than just the so-called conventional success, the conventional uh, maybe money, power, like all this, like people are so crazy about them, like particularly in our world. But when you know about impermanence, right? The Buddhist teachings is also about impermanence uh, the, the emptiness of all things. Uh, there's no actually permanent fixed nature attached to anything you may think you own here. So, so what you were a king or a queen, right? In, in, when you face impermanence, impermanence doesn't know if you are like a great king, then impermanence will not happen to you. It's not like that. So Dhammakara clearly understood the Buddha's teachings my Buddhist teaching is really about the truth of life and the universe. And then he renounced his kingdom, like all the things that he cannot actually possess infinitely. I, at the time of death, all we have owned, we think we have owned, that we have pursued 
that we now think maybe it's such a big deal in my life because uh, this work, this job, this, uh, I don't know, relationship, this person, etc. When you are really facing death in that moment, uh, you know that, oh, actually all this, they don't really mean so much. And they actually, <laughs> maybe I want to say meaningless, but they're not going to follow you after you go, after you leave this world, right? We Buddhists must understand this clearly. And once we have this kind of understanding, and it's actually important for us to know that, why it's actually important for us to cultivate the Dharma and why we should actually be diligent with our practice, be diligent with our name for. Like sometimes we can be lazy, I can be lazy, right? but well, that's why we need this constant reminder of impermanence and how impermanence can really happen to us in any form at any time. So Dhammakara, what a clever person. I like clearly understood this, just gave up everything like Shikimoni Buddha and became a monk. I, I'm not saying that you must give up everything to practice the Dharma, but yeah, for people like them, I really like wholeheartedly like pursuing this path. And it's also not passive. Some people may think, oh, you know, renouncement sounds like so passive like it's like he is like abandoning the world to live like a monk like so so passive it's not like that like if you were a king like who can you save you're also helping people right whether you're a doctor you're a professor in your career whatever we are also helping people in our own ways but look at the scope of that if you were a king, like if he were a king, at most who can, he can help? The people in his country, right? That's it. That's the limit. Even being a king has limit. That's the limit of being a king. But if he becomes a monk, who he can help? And cultivate the body of us practices, he can help all beings in the entire Dharma realms. Right? He's no longer confined by any position in the world. That's why taking the monastic life is so prestigious in this way. Like you can actually help all sentient beings. And not only in this lifetime. And when we talk about uh, the Buddhist career, it really extends infinitely. And also like, after we go to the Pure Land, really to all the worlds in the 10 directions, absolutely no limit. So he was a very, very, a clever person, a person with great wisdom and understood this clearly. Not only understood, he also acted upon it and generated the unsurpassed bodhicitta, make great vows to liberate all sentient beings out of suffering. And like I said, all different Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they have different vows. And with Dhammakara, his vow was to want to create a pure land that surpassed all Buddha lands by just reciting his name and people can all come to his land to realize enlightenment. So this was kind of like the, the blueprint he had in his mind. And also what's the, the name of Amitabha Buddha? Like we know that it's infinite life, infinite light, infinite abundance, infinite everything. So infinite life like is really important for us. Like to most people, life is actually the most valuable thing in the world. Uh, if we have a short life, uh, we don't get to actually uh, enjoy anything or to get to see anything. So to have a longer life is really good. But it's not so good when this infinite life is in infinite darkness, like in the hell realm. Like beings in the hell realm also live for tremendously long, long lifetime. Like even up to 84,000 kappas, countless kappas, they cannot even exit the hell realm. In a way, they kind of also almost like they have infinite life, but they don't have infinite light. It's like infinite darkness. So we need both, actually. We need infinite life and infinite light. And infinite light, light represents time, and light uh, represents wisdom. So we need all of this and transcend time and space, infinite abundance, everything. Is which really is actually within all beings. 
by the Buddha nature. Our Buddha nature is infinite life, infinite light, infinite abundance, and beyond. So Dhammakara, being such a wise person, cultivated diligently, and he was utmost in wisdom, etc. So in it describing great details, like at the opening of the Infinite Life Sutra, like how he cultivated diligently, etc. And he also asked his teacher, Tathagata of the World Freedom Kim, to help. And he was also being very modest. I, he said, no, um, the world on the one, I want to create this pure land. So people can just by hearing my name, can all come to my land. Like, it's such an easy way to help save sentient beings. And he asked the world on the one whether it's actually possible. Like, it's a little bit like maybe an entrepreneur want to start like a great company. And then he asked his mentor uh, whether this is actually possible. Is it doable? Uh, he was also being very modest. And Tathagata of World Freedom Kim, uh, his teacher said, uh, there's a metaphor from the Infinite Life Sutra. He said, uh, just like the ocean, uh, with a great, great ocean, if you were to measure uh, the depth of the ocean, if a person were to measure a depth of the ocean, uh, for countless eons, if he was so persistent and would not give up, he can also achieve that. So if you really have deep determination, then there is really nothing you cannot achieve. So he also really encouraged him. And then Damakara was like, oh, thank you teacher, but like, this is really uh, beyond my capacity at the moment. Uh, please, you know, uh, reveal it to me, like teach me, show me how I can actually do this. And then the Tathagata of the World Free King, Freedom Kim revealed to him about 21 billion Buddha lands for hundreds of billions of years. So the Buddha has great spiritual powers that the Buddha can reveal you the worlds of the 10 directions. So he revealed to him like all these worlds in all these 10 directions. Like it's like a scream that just came out. Oh, this world here to the West, there's this world, this world, this world, this world, like all these Buddha lands. And for a very, very, very long time, and after that, he understood them clearly. So what does it mean? He understood that he could see really clearly how uh, the law of karma uh, applies in all these uh, different lands. And he compared them in great details. Compare all these Buddha lands and take the good and leave off the evil. So there are some uh, worlds such as our world. We have uh, the three evil realms. We have also a relatively good realm, like the heavenly realm. Uh, the human realm is like good and bad all together, and then also the evil realm. And then there are also other worlds that they don't have evil realms. Uh, there are actually many worlds also with evil realms, etc. So he compared with all of this, like all different characteristics of all this land. Cultivate diligently and single-heartedly for five kapas for the merit needed for his great Buddha land. I remember we talk about what kapha mean, uh, five kapas, a long, long, long time, uh, to us at least, uh, which surpassed all those Buddha lands. So he was really diligent. Uh, diligent is uh, maybe undermined his capacity already, right? And very detailed. So a lot of people ask, oh, you know, how did Amitabha Buddha actually generated his pure land? So in the sutra, it kind of like talk about this a little bit, but still for us, it's not possible to understand the Buddha's capacity. But to us, it's like, maybe we are uh, sort of like hearing stories from the sci-fi. Like, this is not sci-fi, and right? these are actually real. And there's no reason for the Buddha to lie to us. Like the Buddha doesn't want your money. The Buddha gave up everything already. And he doesn't need your money. And there's no motivation. And no, no profit. Um, and also because we know that a lot of people have seen Amitabha Buddha has sought rebirth. So really currently it's not really uh, up to the level of our mind to understand exactly how Amitabha Buddha did this. Although in the sutra, it sort of like just told us like briefly. 
So because of his teacher revealed to him like all these different worlds, like 21 billion Buddha lands, and then he compare like all these lands and then take up, take the good ones and leave off the evil. And then he really cultivated for a tremendously long, long time. Now from that, he cultivated for five kappas. But remember, even before that, he had already cultivated for, you know, countless eons already. So he already generated great merit. And then with all this merit needed, like he eventually manifest his pure land. Again, inconceivable state. Inconceivable means that we cannot conceive unless we are a Buddha. Like only Buddhas can know about the Buddhas. So then he completed all the acts of purity for his Buddha land and again come to his teacher and then Tathagata of World Freedom King told him, you know, quickly, please speak of your great vows because he said, uh, well, on one, now I have actually completed uh, what's needed for my pure land. And then his teacher was, of course, very happy, like, very proud to have a great student like this. I said, okay, please, please uh, talk about them. So let all beings to hear about them, to make them happy. And then those who hear, uh, to attain great joy, they can also attain the great benefit. Okay, Dhammakara said, the Dharma storehouse said, may the world on one listen and observe with great mercy. So this is from the sutra. If I attain the supreme body, realize the ultimate enlightenment, the Buddha land I reside in will be adorned with immeasurable and inconceivable meritorious adornments. There will be no harems, no hungry girls, no animals, no flying insects, and no larvae alike. All beings, including those from the hell realm and the three evil paths, who come to be born in my land, will all be transformed by my teachings. They will all realize Anuttaya Sanya Sambodhi and never again fall into the evil realms. If this vows can be attained, then I will become a Buddha. If not, may I not attain supreme enlightenment. Now, this is, these are the first two vows of Amitabha Buddha. And we don't need to worry, they have definitely all realized because we know that Amitabha Buddha has now become a Buddha. Uh, 10 great kapas ago already become a Buddha no longer Bodhisattva Dhammakara, but already Amitabha Buddha, which means that all his great vows have been realized. So he began with, if I attain the Supreme Bodhi, realize the ultimate enlightenment, the Buddha land I recite will be adorned with immeasurable and inconceivable meritorious adornments. So remember when the Buddha talk about I, when the Buddha refer to the pronoun I, he's not really talking about like when we use the word I, like when we think, oh, I, 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 my, 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 like all this, we are referring to this illusional self that which we are currently attached. The Buddha already had no attachment to the I. When he used this word I, it's only a mere convenience for us to understand. It's like a way of communication, but he no longer has this uh, attachment to any illusional self. There's no self already, like even for an arhat already known self, what says about the Buddha. And Amitabha Buddha is really being very modest here. Right? He said, if I attain the Supreme Bodhi, of course he has, he will definitely attain. Right? This is really uh, shows also how, how modest he was. And then the Buddha land I reside in. So in Buddhism, when we talk about Buddha land, it also means that in this world, in this land, it can mean the Buddha's pure land and also uh, the Buddha's uh, teaching uh, world. Uh, the Shakyamuni Buddha's Buddha land is in the Saha world. Shakyamuni Buddha is teaching also in the Saha world. The Saha world is also Shakyamuni Buddha's pure land in a way. Yeah, so the, the Buddha land residing will be adorned with immeasurable and inconceivable meritorious adornments. Uh, it's important here to know meritorious adornments. So why there are so many wonderful, beautiful, like incredible things in the Pure Land? 
how they sort of manifested is really due to the immeasurable and inconceivable merit Amitabha Buddha cultivated for countless eons, and thus it manifests those adornments. Like it's different maybe from this world. Like if you were adornments, it's like beautiful things that can adorn. We we may think. Like in our world, oh my my house, like maybe a Christmas tree, whatever. <laughs> and this we may use money in exchange for for that. Whereas in the pure land, it's not it's not like that. Like Amitabha Buddha did not have to like use money to build anything, like nothing like that. All these adornments that we will see when we go to the pure land, they were all because of the immeasurable and inconceivable merit. It's called meritorious adornments. And like this phrase we need to uh, get used to when we're talking about the pure land. It's a, because of this merit and thus the land is manifested. And merit is a little bit different from uh, virtues, from blessings. Like when we talk about uh, people with uh, maybe good virtues, good blessings, like it could be because uh, they cultivated good deeds. I, if you are generous, you make a donation, a large amount of donation, a uh, philanthropist, whoever, uh, you cultivate also blessings. Uh, maybe you are a virtuous person. And what's different about merit? And of course, you will also have great merit of that if, okay, that's if, if you are not attached to the good deeds you are doing, if you are not attached to what you will get in return, Okay, can we see the difference? There are some people who also cultivate good and then they expect something in return, I, including Buddhists, right? They heard, oh, if I give more, I will gain more. Uh, so maybe I give $1, I hope I'll gain $100 in return. <laughs> like this is kind of attachment. So, so maybe you go and give $1. By doing this, you will definitely generate blessings in the future for sure because of the law of karma but you may not have much merit if you're attached to what you will get in return. Does that make sense? You are attached to, oh, I'm doing such a great deed. I'm a great philanthropy. I mean, you know, I'm such a wonderful person, blah, blah, blah. And then when I'm doing this good deeds, I will get a lot of things in return. Uh, if you're so much attached to this, there's not much merit. So bodhisattvas cultivate good deeds, uh, cultivate giving without attached to anything. I also found the Diamond Sutra. Bodhisattva is not a bind, non-abiding, and not a bind in anything when they practice uh, generosity. Uh, they are not even attached to, oh, I'm generous, or what I may get in return. So this is what we call merit. When we're not attached, uh, you have great merit, infinite merit. And again, you're not even attached to this either. Okay, so, there will be no how rams, no hungry goats, no animals, no flying insects, and no larvae alike. Can we say Amitabha Buddha really thought so clearly in great details? And why do we think this is like the first vow Amitabha Buddha says? Like why not other things? Why, first of all, no how rams, no hungry goats, no, emo, no animals? Uh, he really tried to get rid of uh, the most horrifying uh, evil rams. He really had this infinite compassion to want to save all sentient beings. He's not saying that those beings from hell cannot come to my land. No, 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 not like that, right? Can we see the next line? All beings, including those from the hell realm and the three evil paths who come to be born in my land will all be transformed by my teachings. So all these beings from other worlds, like from the evil path, they can all go to Amitabha Buddha's pure land. Right? Sometimes people ask, can okay, my animal go to the pure land? Right? Very clearly, the first vow answers that, yes, your dog, your cat, your, your chicken, right? if they can somehow near for maybe a bit difficult, a bit tricky uh, for them to understand. But if they had great enough roots in the, in the past, time, uh, past lives, who knew? It's possible. In the history, they had also been recorded animals uh, sought rebirth. And currently I'm also uh, studying this uh, a record of sages of the Pure Land. This is a, a book that was written in the Qing Dynasty in China, which recorded all the rebirth cases uh, from the past, not all, like recorded a lot of uh, 
uh, well-known rebirth cases uh, from the past time, a very first time when Pyongyang Buddhism came to China, and then up to the Qing Dynasty in China, it is called Jintu Shenxian Lu. So it recorded so many, so many cases. Uh, there are four books in total like, all together, so which I intend also to translate them in the future. I don't think they have been translated yet. So really a lot of, a lot of rebirth cases. And the, those rebirth cases recorded about uh, not only monks and nuns seek rebirth, but also uh, lay Buddhist and also animals. I, I read some uh, parrots, uh, rebirth cases of parrots from that book. So very interesting. Uh, in the future, I'll also share. And I think also on the internet, you can also see some, I don't know, I heard someone say a rat. I think there was like an animation about a rat who saw rebirth to the pure land as well. So it's possible, like not only animals, also hungry ghosts, also beings from the hell realm, they can all seek rebirth, but it's just much more difficult than us humans. Uh, why? Uh, first of all, it's not easy to encounter the Dharma in the hell realm, in the hungry ghost realm. But isn't Siddhagaba Bodhisattva in the hell realm? Yes, although Siddhagaba Bodhisattva is in the hell realm and also other Bodhisattva are in the hell realm to want to help those beings. But it's so difficult because of heavy karmic obstacles. So difficult for beings in the hell realm not to be attached to their suffering, not to be attached to their anger. Uh, anger resonates with the hell realm. Uh, some people like, oh, you know, there is no hell realm. Uh, the human realm is already like hell. Well, they, they don't know what hell realm is like. Go and read the Siddhagaba Sutra, which I just recited, uh, chanted for one hour just now. Uh, in that sutra, I think, uh, chapter three, chapter four, right? it talks really clearly in greatest details than any other sutra you can find about all these different names of the Haram, different types of the Haram, what kind of karmic retribution that may lead beings to which kind of Haram and what kind of punishment one will receive in the Haram. It's also inconceivable. <laughs> it's really beyond what we could even understand like to the, the great extent of suffering of those beings in the hell realm, uh, particularly if they fall into a worst hell realm, uh, like unintermittent hell, hell realm, like the five unintermittent hell realm, uh, which they really uh, would not have any rest to the kind of suffering they experience. Here, if you think, oh, you know, you suffer so much, your life is horrible, Blah blah. You don't know about those beings in the hell realm. You don't know how each moment they keep suffering. Not only that, there's no rest. Like they cannot die. Like once they die, a second immediately they will again be alive <laughs> for a really long, long lifespan. And then they keep suffering. There's no end to the kind of punishment they will be received. Also due to their karma. It's not because of uh, those uh, people in the hell realm, they were so evil, they want to keep punishing people. It's not like that. It's really because of the karma that they're being punished. A way for us to maybe understand a little bit is that when we become so angry, maybe at somebody, we think maybe other people cause our suffering, right? Maybe remember, recall a situation where you felt so much anger because you think of other people that actually create this harm, this suffering on you. So you were so angry at others. But who actually hurt the most by your anger? Maybe not the other person because the other person may not even be in front of you. Like who knows? Or, or he or she may be in front of you. But at the moment when you become so angry, like you may even feel like this fire like burning inside you. And you yourself is actually suffering. It's a, you, at that moment, you are resonating with the hell realm. So reincarnation doesn't just happen at the time of death. It happens in every day of our life, every moment. Right? When we feel happy and blissful, when we are doing the 10 good deeds, we resonate with the heavenly realm. When we kneel for, we resonate with the pure land, which is outside the cycle of reincarnation, which is great. 
right? When we are uh, maybe observed by precepts, we are also being a good person. We resonate with the human realm. When we feel so hungry that we can't stop eating, like there are also people with uh, this kind of habit, right? They love to eat so much that like you see them just eat all the time. They cannot stop. What kind of realm they're resonating? The hungry goes realm. Uh, due to the, the greed, they cannot control the greed of eating and also selfish. Uh, there are some people, maybe they're very selfish, very stingy. Uh, they maybe <laughs> eat a lot of things themselves, but they don't want to share with others. Uh, resonating with the hungry goat's ram. And or if they're being a bit stupid, or maybe very stupid, or very ignorant, or maybe they are a good person, but it can be very also ignorant and they resonate with the animal realm. So really each moment we are reincarnating depending on the state of mind. So at the time of death, right, our last thoughts and also our accumulated karma will, will have this karma force that will drag us to the realm that we resonate with. So it's really, really horrified to be in the Saha world when you understand a bit more about the kind of sufferings beings face in the three evil paths. If you think the human ran already, wow, so much suffering, you know, there, there are, there's war, there's this uh, scary uh, virus, uh, blah, 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 so many conflicts, etc. Uh, look at just the animal realm, right? How many animals are being killed per day, right? Not even talking about per year, even per day. Right? Millions, billions. Can you imagine the suffering of those animals? What says about realms that we can't even see? Like the hunger goes around the hell realm. You cannot see the hell realm. People may be like, oh, how do you know that Hellraiser is true? Right? Prove it to me. I cannot prove to you. Like from the Siddhagava Sutra, it says very clearly, only those with the resonating karma, they will go to the Hellraiser or maybe with the great assistance of the Buddhas and Bodhisattva, they can show you the Hellraiser. Why? Because they also go in there to help. It's a bit like, we know there are prisons in this world, but we don't know exactly where the prisons are. I, maybe we're not interested. I, we don't even know. I, I don't know where's the prison in my city. Although I live in the city, I've never seen a prison. Why? Because I have not done anything wrong that will make me go into the prison yet. And I'm not interested in going into the prison. It's a bit like that. So hell realms really exist. And also infinite hell realms. Like a lot of hell realms for those who are interested. Go and read the Siddhagava Sutra. It will make us understand about how the law of karma works much better. Sometimes we think maybe we are, are good people, we understand the law of karma, maybe not. Right? It's actually so easy to fall into the three evil realms. That's why it's so dangerous. And that's why Amitabha Buddha has this infinite compassion. He really put those beings who suffered the most up front. Like he did not say about you know humans, how heavenly beings, etc. at the beginning, right? He want to save those who really suffer the most. And in his land, he just immediately, uh, he eliminated absolutely all these evil realms. So we can feel really safe if we go to the pure land. Like imagine if the pure land is like a world with like just so wonderful, you know, everything, but there are still the hell realm. There's still a possibility for us to fall into the evil realms. Do we still want to go? And maybe not so much. Or maybe it's not, it's not perfect yet. Like it's like the heavenly, heavenly realm. Like heaven realms are really wonderful, really beautiful. And people in, have such a long lifespan there. But when their lifespan ends, and how do we know a heavenly beings' lifespan ends? Like when they're going to die, right? They are born transformationally, are different from us humans where we are born from our mother's womb, right? It's different in the heaven. It's like transformational body. When they're about to die, like their underarm, they will begin to sweat. And then the, also the, the body, the colors of the body will fade away. 
and then they will know that oh this is where they're gonna fall like there is actually an end to the great blessings they were enjoying before so it's dangerous if for any world actually to have this evil realms and to have the possibility to fall into the evil realms so infinite life is good but it's only good when you are in a great environment that will not change into evil so amitabha buddha has really well thought after and he want to save those beings who are really in the worst possible conditions and also really to secure us when we are there you will not only that there are no evil rams in his pure land and those who go into his land particularly including those from the hell realm and the three evil path i always welcome absolutely he treats all beings impartially it's like a state the mind of the buddha really sees the buddha nature of all sentient beings they will all be transformed by his teachings with no exception it doesn't matter how maybe heavy the karmic obstacle the person has doesn't matter once you are in amitabha buddha's pure land you will all be transformed it's like the sun right when the sun shines everything melts it doesn't matter whether the ice it's in north pole or in china I don't know so doesn't matter there's no difference uh, just it warms the people's heart uh, things just melt so it's like that when you go to amitabha buddha's pure land we will all be like so much uh shone maybe by amitabha buddha's great light and immediately like this light really will can activate our buddha nature and we will totally be transformed by his teachings amitabha buddha doesn't need to talk to us not like in this world right? if we like teach something share something we need to be like talk 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 and no need right it's just pure bright light and when you see those light immediately transformed not only that they will all realize anuttaya sanya sambodhi and never again fall into the evil realms right this it's like a great security great insurance for us when we go to the pure land we will all realize the ultimate enlightenment which is anuttaya sanya sambodhi without exception you will not need to worry oh you know what if i'm so stupid i have such great karmic obstacles blah 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 no need right no need to worry about anything like this and you will never again fall into the three evil, uh, the evil realms this include if you were to go to other worlds to help save sentient beings you will also not fall into the three evil the, the evil realms like this amitabha buddha also further illustrate it in later vows so if this vow can be attained then i will become a buddha if not may i not attain supreme enlightenment okay so this are the first two great vows of amitabha buddha first is the land without evil path and second is never fall into the evil realms okay so we will chance the merit first and then we'll uh, look at uh, what comment we may have okay so you can join your hands to your heart center may the resulting merit and virtue adorn the buddha's pure land repay the four great kindnesses above and relieve the suffering of those in the three evil path may those who see and hear this all generate the unsurpassed bodhicitta when this retribution body comes to an end be reborn in the land of ultimate bliss namo amitabha buddha namo amitabha so chen chen ask jia wen do how officials who punish how beings create bad karma okay a good question actually mm, actually not because the law mara by the sort of like the top health official right, who sort of governs all health officials so law mara from the sutra like he said he really did not want to punish those beings he did not punish those beings because he wanted to like he purely did so in accordance to the law of karma 
And for those health officials, it's also not because of they are willing to go to the health to be officials. It's also because of their karma. So they are there. And in, even amongst some officials, there are also incarnations of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas there right, to try to help those beings. So they don't create karma by punishing those beings because it's not like they willingly punish those beings because those beings are being punished by their own karma. And Lord Mara judge simply uh, completely complies with the law of karma. So those beings who are suffered in hell, by like being punished in hell, they were all actually all because of their own karma. It's not because of other people I really want to willingly punish them. It's not like that. It's because of their karma, because of their, their state of mind. So they, they saw this kind of punishment. They're being punished. Other people, they cannot see. And there was actually a story in, in China where a famous writer or also like an official in the government at that time uh, in the Republic of China. So uh, a very famous a story, a true story, that he was being dragged by some uh, beings uh, from the hell realm because they wanted him to be uh, one of the officials to judge some cases because the courts in the hell realm, they were so busy. Right? They, they did not have enough people to do the job. So in when he was asleep right, during the night, he was being dragged by them. Uh, they, those people came in. Uh, of course, other people cannot see, right? Just he could see. And then uh, they took him to uh, the hell realm. Right? We can think of it as different dimensions, okay? Different dimensions. And then he told other hell officials, he said, oh, you know, I heard in the hell realm, there are this kind of punishment where people were being burned. Uh, it just sounds so horrible. Can they not do it? And then those... Uh, officials, they just smiled and then took him to that place where beings were being punished like that. And then he said, oh, actually, I don't see anything. How is that possible? How is it like that? And there was actually not, no one being punished. He could not even see anything happening there. And to him, there was just nothing. But where the hell officials said, like, look, these are the beings who are currently being burned by fire like, all the time. And then he immediately understood like it's really because of the state of mind that resonate with, it's because they created their own karma, like resonate with that kind of phenomena. Right? So other people cannot see if it's not their karma. It's a bit like that. It's not because how officials want to punish them. It's not. It's because those beings who were there, they felt like that. Right, really, but to them, it's really real for those beings who are experiencing those suffering. Although, in a way, it's illusion, but it is real for those beings who are attached to this 